Chapter 21 of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 The Truce Blake had been educated at a big English public school where he had learnt that the keynote to an Englishman's life is straightness. Further, in the British Army he had found that all good Britishers try their level best to run straight. Early in 1921 there had been a strong rumour in the IRC that the British government had come to secret terms with the Sinn Féin, and that after a period of window-dressing a truce would be declared. Then would follow a lot of talk, and the terms of settlement would emerge. It was even reported that a conference had been held in Norway of representatives of the British government and Sinn Féin, and also a representative from each of the Dominions, and a settlement arrived at. At the time, the Prime Minister fired off one of his loudest and most daring defiances at Sinn Féin, that he would never give in, nor would he ever treat with the murder gang in Ireland, that the Crown forces in that country would be supported by all the resources of the Empire, and so on ad nauseum. And this, as Blake heard a cynic remark, was a sign that the sinister rumour was most likely true. Blake had dismissed the idea with a laugh, but when the truce bomb burst, his mind at once flew back to the secret settlement rumour, now months old, and he began to suspect, with a horrible fear, that they had been sold, and badly sold. Naturally, the first effects on the police were bad. The older men who had been let down before laughed and cried to each other, "'Sold again!' but the younger ones, who had yet to learn the ways of politicians, took the matter to heart and started to brood over it. There were several questions to which they badly wanted an answer, the chief being, if there was to be this complete surrender, why had it not been made long ago when the lives of many of their relations and pals in the army and R.I.C. might have been saved, not to mention the lives of many loyalists? These valuable lives had been freely given in order that Ireland should be freed from the murderous plague of gunmen, in the same way as during the late war the lives of the Empire's best were sacrificed in order that we should be freed from the murderous plague of the Boches. Further, they wanted to know what terms had been made with regard to their comrades who had fallen into the hands of the IRA. The Loyalists were staggered, knowing that their worst fears would now be realized, to be handed over to the murder gang, which was the reward the cynics in the Dublin clubs had always prophesied, would be England's return for the efforts of the Loyalists during the war. However, they could say nothing and do nothing, but simply make the best of their fate. The neutrals, most of whom had changed their flag as often as the British government had changed its mind, now, of course, openly threw in their lot with Sinn Féin. The townspeople and farmers openly rejoiced at the prospect of even a temporary peace, though in their hearts many of them knew that there could be no real peace in Ireland until the gunmen had been wiped out or reduced to a state of impotence by disarming them. However, the future could take care of itself as far as they were concerned. For the first few days of the truce, the Sinn Feiners appeared to be doubtful whether their wonderful luck could be really true, and consequently lay low. Then men and boys who had been on the run for many moons returned to Ballybor and gave an exhibition of See the Conquering Hero Comes in the streets daily. Among them men wanted badly for atrocious murders, who now snapped their fingers openly in the faces of the police. A policeman could not walk the streets of Ballybor without meeting these swaggering fellows, who openly laughed and jeered at them when they passed. However, a considerable number did not return, and on their relations inquiring about their whereabouts from the IRA liaison officer, they were told they never would come back. Gradually, being sure they were indeed safe, and that in truth they had the British government on the run instead of being on the run themselves, they grew bolder and more insolent. One brute went up to the sentry outside the police barracks and deliberately spat on him, hoping, no doubt, that the constable would lose his temper and break the truce. The constable stepped into the barracks and returned at once with the Sinn Féin flag, with which he carefully wiped the offending stains off his face and tunic under the nose of the astonished gunman. He then proceeded to stand on the flag in the mud and asked the gunman, "'What about it?' 
For some seconds the gunman stood irresolute, then turned and walked off, looking a complete ass, followed by the loud laughter of the police. From now the Republicans proceeded to take over the government of the district, the police standing by, helpless, bound hand and foot by the strict order that on no account were they to disturb the peace atmosphere. How the Bosch must be laughing at us! In every parish, Republican courts were advertised to be held in the local papers, and were held without let or hindrance, the advertisements stating that summons and so forth can be had on application to blank, clerk of the court. And why not? Had not the IRA beaten Lloyd George to his knees, and was not the British government on the run? To give the comical touch necessary in Ireland, the R.M. continued to receive instructions from the castle to attend the various petty sessions courts in every district and deal out the British version of the law. Probably the first time, and please God, the last, that any part of Great Britain and Ireland has been governed by two sets of laws at the same time. With regard to this disgraceful state of affairs, one particular case will give a good illustration of how low British law has fallen in the west of Ireland. A very decent man called O'Brien, who had been a herd to the congested district's board, bought a farm from the board with three other men, the farm being divided into four. This did not suit the landless members of the transport union in the district, whose idea was that they should have the land without paying for it. They told O'Brien to get out, but he refused. They then proceeded to smash the fences and drive and injure his cattle. O'Brien built up the fences and put his cattle back. They next proceeded to beat O'Brien, who afterwards went into Ballybor, but returned without taking any action, as they told him there that there was now no law in the country. That night they beat him again. The process consisted of first holding him while a powerful man closed his eyes with repeated blows of his fists, and then they hammered him to their heart's content and left him in the road for dead. Hours afterwards O'Brien crawled home on his hands and knees, he was practically blinded, and appears to have found his way home by instinct, and some days afterwards, when he had recovered a little, he went to the police in Ballybor. A magistrate happened to be at the barracks at the time, and insisted that steps should be taken to protect O'Brien and punish the savages who had beaten him, though the police told him that they were afraid that it was quite useless to try. However, the magistrate took O'Brien's information. The case came on week after week at the Ballybor Petty Sessions, always to be adjourned at the request of the police, waiting instructions from the castle. At last, O'Brien, in despair, took his case to the local Sinn Féin court, and here the chief offender was fined twenty-seven pounds and the others large sums, and they were warned that if they interfered with O'Brien again they would be dealt with very severely. And this is a good example of how British law protects a decent citizen in Ireland at the present time. But one forgets that the peace atmosphere must not be disturbed at all costs but is there any wonder that the people are fast leaving the king's courts for those of Sinn Féin and of their own free will now? Republican local government inspectors appeared in every district and quickly ousted the king's inspectors, held courts of inquiry on unfortunate road surveyors who had refused to take the oath of allegiance to Dial Arain, and tried to sack loyal dispensary doctors. The chief amusement of the local gunmen on leave, and of their friends, male and female, was now to spend their time joy-riding through the countryside, flying Sinn Féin flags on their commandeered lorries, and singing the soldier's song whenever they passed any police or a barracks. One expedition of this kind went out to Ballyrick on a Sunday, and returned to Ballybor about midnight. Blake happened to be passing down the main street at the time, and encountered a party of drunken bank clerks trying to see how much row they could make. Blake remonstrated with them and told them that if they did not go home quietly, he would have them arrested. One clerk at once started to sing the soldier's song at the top of his voice, and another shouted at Blake in an insolent voice, "'What about a truce, Mr. B, D. I? Blake saw red. He had borne and suffered much for many days, and he gave the bank clerk a full drive on the chin, which sent him flying. 
The whole party then swiftly retreated in silence. The following day Blake paid a visit to the bank and said to the clerk he had ousted the previous night, "'Look here, Mr. Bank Clerk, don't think I hit you last night because you were drunk. There's a fine open yard at the back of the barracks, and if you will come round now we can fight it out.' Abject apologies from Mr. Bank Clerk, and Blake left the bank. One morning a woman arrived at the barracks in a state of great distress and asked to see the D.I. She told Blake that she lived in a small house in Cloonalla, which she rented from another woman in the village. Twice her landlady had tried in a British court to evict her and had failed. The landlady then applied to the local IRA, who promptly turned the unfortunate woman with all her furniture and belongings into the street, and there she remained. When she remonstrated with them, they showed her a warrant signed by the village Sinn Féin magistrate and left her. Blake at once applied to the county inspector for instructions, who applied to the higher authorities. Back came the answer, see circular so-and-so, which, on being turned up, stated that all breaches of the truce should be at once reported. Meanwhile, the woman remained homeless. Neighbors in an Irish village nowadays fight shy of an IRA victim, and circulars are not substitutes for roofs. Again, Blake tried to get leave to take action, and this time the answer was to forward four copies of the case to the police adviser in Scotland. In despair, he put his pride in his pocket and applied to the IRA liaison officer of the district for help and the next day the liaison officer arrived in Ballybor, an ex-soldier and a well-known murderer. Blake felt that he could hardly stand this final insult to an honourable uniform, but duty is duty, and a truce must be kept. The liaison officer went out in a car to Clunala and ordered the local braves to put the woman and her furniture back in her house, which they flatly refused to do, and that was the end of the matter. After some weeks' rest, the chiefs of the IRA issued an order calling all men to the colours, whether they liked it or not. It has been mentioned that the country round Ballybor was famous for its excellent shooting, grouse, snipe, woodcock, duck, and geese chiefly. And in the days before the rebellion, many Englishmen must have spent happy times shooting and fishing in the many shooting lodges dotted about on the mountains and moors to the east and west of Ballybor. Now all these lodges are occupied by instructors of the IRA, who take so many of the young men and boys of the district in relays for an eight days intensive training course, drilling, musketry, instructions in the use of Lewis and Thompson machine guns, bombing, and twenty-five mile route marches in full fighting order, the latter most unpopular. Not only have all members of the IRA to attend these courses, but every young man and boy who had previously refused to join up have to go, and there is no refusing to go now. You may miss your garden boy or shop assistant to meet him in the course of the week taking part in a route march, or if you are foolishly inquisitive, you may see him at dawn advancing across your domain in company with other boys or firing his musketry course. Blake watched two lorry loads of these recruits setting off on a Monday morning from the main street of Ballybor under his very nose, Sinn Féin flags flying, and they sang the soldier's song for his special benefit. About two miles from Ballybor there lives a retired officer in a nice house with a good domain, a man who served the empire well and truly for many years. When the war was over, he retired, fondly hoping to spend the remainder of his days in peace and comfort in his old family home. But not so. He happened to be the owner of a domain which the transport union had promised to its members. So they tried repeatedly to stampede him out of the country, but that failed. Now his place is occupied by what the IRA call a weekend camp for the drilling and instruction of the Ballybor shop boys. They use his cooking utensils, burn his turf, and make the night hideous with their yells and oaths, so that the officer and his family find it impossible to get any rest. Moreover, they, the IRA, do not appear to be strong in sanitary sections, and they told him that if he took any action they would burn his place to the ground. What action could he take? 
There is no law in the country except the law of the pistol. The police are now bound hand and foot. They report these outrages to the castle, and what happens? Nothing. The government are far too busy hunting for that elusive formula which is to turn this Irish hell into a paradise, to worry about a stupid old retired officer. He has no vote in England, nor can he ever affect their political careers. And why all these feverish military preparations, either to invade Ulster when the time of a settlement and peace comes, or, if the truce is broken, to massacre the R.I.C. and the Loyalists? About this time a constable, transferred from the southwest to Ballybor, brought with him a story he swore it was true, which will take a queer lot of formula to explain away. Not long ago the IRA ran a cargo of arms on the coast where he was stationed openly with the police looking on. The police at once reported the affair and were told that it did not matter as the arms would never be used. Presumably the authorities meant that these arms would not be used against the ground forces. But what about loyal Ulster and those most unfortunate of people today in Europe, outside of Russia, the southern Irish loyalists? Apparently the IRA chiefs are believers in games for their men, as witness the following advertisement which appeared in the Ballybor shop windows. Great football match! North Ballyrick Flying Column, IRA, versus Ballybor Patrickites. Pay your shilling and see how we enjoy the truce. The transport union unwittingly supplied the comical element of the situation when they started a great row with the IRA people in Ballybor. It appeared that the IRA had been in the habit of not paying the union rate of wages to the stalwarts of the transport union for digging trenches across roads and breaking down bridges during the war, and now they were furious because the IRA refused to pay up the difference and threatened them with all sorts of horrible things, and the IRA laughed at them. People in England have not the remotest conception of the terrible Frankenstein monster which de Valera and company have reared up and armed in Ireland, a hideous monster of murderous and armed gunmen, fearing neither God nor man, which in the summer of 1921 was on the point of being exterminated by British bayonets to make this beautiful island of Ireland once more a clean and wholesome land where men might dwell in peace that chance has gone will it ever occur again and if it does will the british government seize their opportunity like men and rid ireland of this terrible menace or will they again be found wanting groping after some wretched formula do people realize why de valera acts the part of the coy fly in hesitating to enter mr lloyd george's talking parlor the sinister reason is that if he once gives up his claim to an Irish Republic, he seals his own doom. The day he enters into a conference with the British government on these conditions, the Irish Republican Brotherhood signs his death warrant, and well he knows it. But if, for argument's sake, a so-called settlement is arrived at, what comes of de Valera's Frankenstein monster? Will it beat its automatics into reaping hooks and convert its machine guns into potato sprayers? Possibly in the minds of English radicals, but nowhere else. And when the Welshman and the Mexican have fooled the English and the Southern Irish with a formula, do they think that any formula ever phrased would fool Ulster? On the day that an Irish Republic is set up, Dominion Home Rule is only another name for it, Sinn Féin, its raison d'etre accomplished, dies. But out of its corpse will arise two parties, or rather armies, for all men in Ireland are armed today, except the loyalists, one consisting of the farmer-shopkeeper class, while the other will be the citizen army of the Bolshevist Labour Party. The rank and file of the IRA consists of farmer's sons, young townsmen, shop assistants, and the like they expect either a fat pension for life or twenty acres of land both have been freely promised to them and both are equally impossible and these disgruntled gunmen all armed will take sides according to their sympathies and before many months are passed these forces will be at each other's throats and the national air of ireland will be the red flag 
like kerensky in russia de valera will disappear in the welter of revolution the r i c have vanished they have already been told that when the ceasefire sounds they will be given a month to clear out of ireland lock stock and barrel the surrender to sinn fein by the british government is a good example of the evil which can be brought about by that modern plague skilful and unscrupulous propaganda the sooner the good elements in england wake up and combine to insist that the necessary action is taken in ireland to enforce law and order the better it will be for both countries and the empire the english people have been fooled by a press which carefully suppressed all news of the true state of affairs in ireland and then gave lying and distorted accounts it is futile to say that the remedy for false reports lies with the law all honest men know that a clever lawyer in a court of law can make a half or three-quarter black lie appear a whole truth white as driven snow as easily as a smart and up-to-date accountant can juggle with a balance sheet to show plus or minus half a million as the necessity arises the day will come in ireland when men will pray to god for a sight of the good old green uniform of the r i c and it will be too late End of chapter 21 End of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown